So you're listening to Ask Your Web Doctor on KMUD Garberville 91.1 FM and from 7.30 until the end of the show at 8 o'clock, you are invited to call in with any questions either related or unrelated to this month's subject of learned helplessness, uh, nervous system and a generalised thyroid questionnaire about uh, certain things that I've come to be asked over time that very much come from misconceptions. I just want to clear up some of those too. Uh, number here, if you live in the area, is 923-3911. If you live outside the area, the uh, toll-free number is 1-800-KMUD-RAD. And we can also be reached, incidentally, toll-free on 1-888-WBMRB for further questions during normal business hours, Monday through Friday. Uh, once again, as is becoming very usual, uh, we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Raymond Pete to share his wisdom with us and to find out some of the latest work that he's been doing. So thank you so much for joining us again, Dr. Pete. <laughs> okay, so as always, uh, for people who perhaps uh, have never heard you uh, or never listened to the show even, it does happen for sure, um, would you just please give an outline of your academic background? Um, in biology, um, I studied mostly at the University of Oregon, 1968 to 72, um, did my PhD uh, dissertation on reproductive aging and uh, how, how the physiology of oxidative metabolism changes uh, with aging and, and uh, interacts with changes in uh, the, all of the hormones. Uh, and since then, I've uh, been developing uh, some of the central ideas that were involved in, in uh, both aging and reproduction. Okay, good. As I know that um, a lot of your research has been uh, fairly revelational in terms of uh, work that is being done uh, both in academic universities and other uh, private research, but which doesn't always come to the fore, or if at least it does, it takes quite a significant time to reach the medical industry. Um, I think tonight's tonight's kind of... um, beginning introduction anyway at least um, for the nervous system has got some fairly new ideas uh, uh, attached to it if you like Uh, but I think rather than getting too um, technical for most people perhaps who are listening because it is a very interesting subject and physiologically it's pretty uh, intricate but for for those people who perhaps don't have a very large amount of uh, science background especially in physiology I think it would be really good um, just to, yeah, just to discuss briefly the uh, two two arms of well, the known two arms of the nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetics, before we actually get into the uh, subject of tonight. Uh, the general way uh, doctors still think about them uh, was a, a set of ideas established just about a hundred years ago, uh, with opposition between. Uh, the uh, relaxing side and the mobile, mobilizing uh, uh, emergency side. And uh, that has tended to be called the, the fight-or-flight reaction f- for the sympathetic nervous system that uh, is uh, based largely on adrenaline. The uh, relaxing uh, parasympathetic side is uh, based mostly on acetylcholine. Uh, but uh, in, in the last 30 or 40 years, uh, a lot of uh, complexity has, has turned up, even though uh, in, in a general sense those oppositions uh, are still accurate, but it uh, turns out there's a lot of overlap. Uh, each part of the nervous system does things that uh, can also be done by the other side. Uh, and uh, each one uh, has more repertoire than uh, just adrenaline or acetylcholine. Uh, they can interact uh, in various ways with serotonin, histamine, and so on. Um, the the um, relaxing side of the nervous system, supposedly, uh, the hundred year old idea is that it takes care of uh, peristalsis and secretion, uh, largely, and uh, um, it slows the heart rate for relaxation, 
uh, and uh, weakens the the strength of the heart contraction, but it uh, strengthens the peristalsis movement of the intestine and wall of the bladder and uh, ureters and uh, uh, stimulates uh, uh, secretion of of a lot of uh, glands, but uh, it, it relaxes the sphincters uh, of the intestine and the bladder uh, and uh, gallbladder and such, so that it it goes with secretion, digestion, and uh, excretion. Okay. Uh, all of the uh, basically vegetative processes. Right. So that's the parasympathetic nervous system. It's all about. What happens after you eat a meal, for example? You just you, you relax, you take it easy, you digest your food. Everything's being produced by the glands that are secreting enzymes into the intestine or the stomach to digest your food. Your heart rate slows down. Everything's fairly. You always think of the parasympathetic as being fairly peaceful and wet, if you like. And, and it tends to take over at night. Right. It helps person go to sleep by slowing the heart rate and and. Uh, it, at least it, it should uh, <laughs> slow things down during the night, but uh, uh, with problems such as uh, diabetes or hypoglycemia or uh, various metabolic uh, disorders, it can uh, get overactive. And instead of just calming things down, slowing the metabolism, uh, lowering blood sugar because you don't need so much, <clears throat> it can uh, cause too much insulin secretion uh, and other glandular secretions, uh, for example, causing uh, too much mucus formation um, and the increased insulin can lower your blood sugar too much and uh, and that can lead to intensified activity of of the nerves, um, intensifying uh, both contraction and relaxation where, where it shouldn't be happening. Okay, so I guess it's the first question, then, in, in the light of uh, what we understand then as the sympathetics and the parasympathetics, um, under the terms, or under the effects, rather, of stress, and um, I think when most people think about stress, they're talking about stressful situations, stressful job, deadlines, and all of those kind of things that can raise your blood pressure or uh, raise your heart rate, uh, make you angry, I don't know, it, just stressful situations. The... Um, the uh, excitotoxic, so this is the uh, state of a cell uh, where it's being stimulated so much, the e- excitation, that stimulation can lead to that toxic effect and that cell death. And this is something that I know uh, you've written about in uh, one of your newsletters recently about the uh, stress-induced excitotoxic effects of the parasympathetics. And it's not something I'd never really... Uh, heard about before in terms of what you've just mentioned about over secretion. Would you describe that a little more? Um, the um, place that it started to be understood was in the uh, learned helplessness uh, situation. Uh, they saw that when an animal uh, believed it couldn't escape from a stressful uh, situation, uh, its heart slowed down instead of accelerating. Uh, the very same signal that would make an animal's heart race if it was wandering around freely and had the possibility of escaping. If it was in a trapped situation, its heart would slow down and uh, it would, uh, given uh, a little too much uh, stress and threat, its heart would actually stop in a relaxed uh, position where uh, without that uh, belief in the impossibility of escape, mm. it would go on struggling for days, yeah. swimming in a tank, for example, <laughs> or uh, with the expectation that it wouldn't be able to escape, it might drown in five or six minutes. Wow. wow. So this is a kind of rationale for the uh, explanation of hope being something that can uh, keep a person alive. Uh, Yeah, exactly. Um, In the 1950s, uh, a biologist uh, shocked a lot of other biologists by uh, talking about uh, the rats, uh, (laughs) hopelessness causing death. Uh Wow. Okay, so 
uh, I know you mentioned uh, uh, so, some part about the uh, the old, well, I say old, but uh, uh, kind of the the, uh, the the standard treatment uh, for Alzheimer's, and how that the uh, the the method by which the uh, approach to Alzheimer's was used is actually pretty pretty bad science in terms of what's understood now about the uh, two arms of the the nervous system and how um, the drugs they're currently using to treat Alzheimer's is actually probably making it worse. Um, yeah, the um, brain processes of, that allow learning and intelligent behavior, um, the cholinergic nerves of the brain are very important in that, as well as uh, the serotonin, adrenaline, uh, several other types of nerve have to be functioning. But uh, several types of uh, Evans uh, made doctors concentrate on the loss of the cholinergic system. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if you uh, stimulate the cholinergic nerves, uh, you can improve uh, learning and, and behavior, but if you aren't increasing energy to keep up with that increased stimulation, right. uh, you um, put the cell in a, a, a stress between uh, having to work harder but not having the fuel to do it. So if, if your uh, cortisol is high, for example, interfering with your ability to use sugar, or if your uh, blood sugar is simply low and you're being stimulated, uh, then the cell tends to die. Hmm. And uh, the, uh, the reasoning that uh, the, the um, Alzheimer's disease was simply uh, a wasting away of the cholinergic nerves led to uh, treating it for the first 10 or 15 years uh, just with chemicals to increase excitation of the cholinergic wow. nerves. <laughs> and uh, uh, that wasn't working at all. People okay. were dying at a higher rate yeah. with liver disease and such. Uh -huh. But uh, from the 1950s, people were already uh, suggesting uh, treating dementia and other brain degenerative diseases with atropine and other chemicals that block the cholinergic nerves. Right. And uh, uh, amandadine, which is now used for treating Parkinson's disease, mm -hmm. uh, was one of the uh, nerve uh, chemicals considered anticholinergic in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Okay. And uh, it, since people were seeing actual improvement with the anticholinergic chemicals, uh, someone said, why not try adding that to the treatment instead of stopping the uh, excitatory cholinergic uh, drugs? Why not add one of these? So they, they reclassified them as uh, acting against another excitatory nervous system the, uh, the system that causes glutamate, uh, uh, MSG, uh, uh -huh. nerve toxicity. Wow. So they, they now call it an anti-NMDA uh, chemical, memantine, which is similar to amandadine. Okay. So it's a very similar chemical, which used to be called anticholinergic, was being used for both Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. But they still go on with the... A doctrine that they have to stimulate the cholinergic system too, right. even though that has never shown improvement. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay, well, you're listening to Ask Your Herb Doctor on KMD Galbaville 91.1 FM, and from 7.30 to the end of the show at 8 o'clock, you're invited to call in with any questions, either related or unrelated to this month's subjects of uh, learned helplessness, nervous system control, and a generalized discussion on uh, thyroid, etc. Um, the number here, if you live in the area, is 923 3911, or if you live outside the area, there's a toll free number, which is 1 800 KMUD RAD. So I uh, just wanted to ask you a bit, a little question about estrogen. I know we've always we talked about estrogen and progesterone and the opposing effects uh, of each and the uh, perceived beneficial effects of estrogen being so widely uh, adopted in the 70s and 80s, 90s even with uh, hormone replacement therapy, but now how 
the revelations are that estrogen is extremely damaging. I know you've always said it's been that way from the very beginning, but what, uh, what, what, uh, how do you look at, at as estrogen? How do you look at estrogen uh, as its destructive features? Uh, and why, why it's so bad for you? Uh, a lot of people by now have heard that uh, uh, there's a, a premenstrual uh, related epilepsy uh, that results from an excess of estrogen in relation to progesterone because uh, estrogen is excitatory while progesterone is calming. And uh, it happens that estrogen intensifies the parasympathetic part of the autonomic nervous system, uh, while progesterone tends to relax that. Uh, you can see that uh, parasympathetic uh, function of estrogen in the uterus. If there's too much estrogen uh, in pregnancy, uh, it will cause uh, strong contractions of the uterus and can cause miscarriage. Okay. And uh, it's activating. Uh, if you give the drug they give uh, to treat Alzheimer's, which is a, a procholinergic drug, it will cause spasms of the uterus, just mm -hmm. like estrogen. Mm -hmm. So estrogen is is acting uh, with or through uh, that part of the nervous system. And uh, when... Uh, there, for about 50 years, there was a puzzle about how uh, acetylcholine or the cholinergic nerves could inhibit the heart and the sphincters while causing contractions of uh, the various ducts and intestine and so on. And they proposed that something was being released in the cells that combined with uh, acetylcholine to determine whether it was excitatory or inhibitory. But uh, the main thing that happens there is that uh, acetylcholine uh, causes cells to produce nitric oxide, uh, the chemical that became famous with Viagra and Rogaine, uh -huh. which causes vasodilation. People always also abuse nitrous oxide, don't they, as a kind of... Uh... Uh, that's a different chemical. Uh, that's uh -huh. actually uh, just a, 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 an anesthetic, uh, pretty safe oh, okay. chemical, uh, nitrous oxide. But oh, okay. nitric oxide is the uh, uh, free radical that you find in smog. And uh, it, it's produced by any cell that's... Uh, excited too strongly and uh, in the situation where uh, the cholinergic stimulation is causing relaxation uh, in blood vessels where it causes vasodilation it's acting by way of uh, increased nitrous nitric oxide and what the nitric oxide is doing is blocking energy production so the the uh, smooth muscle of the, of the blood vessel or sphincter, wherever it is, it simply doesn't have the energy to contract. It, it uh, actually steals oxygen from the mitochondria and, and uh, blocks the use of any oxygen that's there. And estrogen uh, happens to activate the enzyme that forms nitric oxide. So it, it works with the cholinergic system, and both of them uh, act partly through uh, increasing the amount of nitric oxide. And progesterone, uh, with its quieting effect, uh, inhibits the enzyme that forms uh, uh, nitric oxide. Okay, good. Now, I, I wanted to ask you, would, in the presence of adequate metabolic energy in the form of sufficient thyroid, would nitric oxide still be able to do this? Um, no, the, um, in situations where they were studying learned helplessness, uh, which produces uh, increased acetylcholine and uh, nitric oxide, uh, they found that either progesterone or thyroid, T3, uh, would block the uh, formation of, of that behavior. It would keep them from dying uh, to too prematurely, and uh, the um, 
thyroid and progesterone both um, interfere with the produ- production of uh, nitric oxide. Okay, um, cool. And in a, a situation of underfunction of the thyroid gland or system, um, it, it's now pretty well established that high blood pressure in a, a very high proportion of the cases is is produced by hypothyroidism. And uh, because of the belief that uh, nitric oxide it has a, a beneficial effect of increasing circulation, as with Viagra mm-hmm. and Rogaine, mm-hmm. uh, the, the, um, the thought was that uh, hypothyroidism uh, must be lowering uh, nitric oxide, but in fact it increases it while uh, still causing contraction of the of the blood vessels and tightening up increasing blood pressure so uh, the um, the effect of, of thyroid is to uh, stop excess nitric oxide or excess cholinergic function or excess estrogen but uh, the um, the medical ideas that have, have been built up on the idea that estrogen is a, a therapeutic thing across the spectrum and uh, that nitric oxide is beneficial because it's produced by uh, multi-billion dollar drugs. <laughs> right. uh, uh, these interlock uh, so that uh, they argue that if estrogen produces nitric oxide, then nitric oxide is, is good and, and so on. Uh, each thing is used as an argument for the other, but when you put them in the context of thyroid and progesterone, uh, you see that uh, the um, actual problem, such as high blood pressure, can involve increased nitric oxide, even though that goes against the uh, mm-hmm. the doctrine. Wow. Yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a rabbit hole that's um, unfortunately clouded by a lot of money uh, and... Uh, advertising thereof to make sure it stays in the forefront of people's belief systems. Um, some of the changes with aging besides uh, high blood pressure, uh, for example, incontinence uh, and uh, edema, mm-hmm. uh, swelling up of the extremities, uh, constipation or uh, at least a slow movement of the digestive system, mm-hmm. uh, uh, leakiness of blood vessels uh, letting fluid swell out and then uh, sluggishness of the lymphatic system allowing the edema to accumulate. Uh, these things are all able to be produced and, and uh, relieved by either increasing or decreasing the amount of nitric oxide in the system. So, so an excess of the cholinergic uh, function uh, leading to overproduction of nitric oxide will cause constipation, incontinence, uh, uh, swelling of the mm-hmm. feet, uh, uh, just about all of the typical uh, symptoms of aging, stress, and shock, and so on. And, and they're all alleviated by thyroid and progesterone as they are kind of opposites. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, so... Another question that I had actually was uh, um, from a from an interaction with another person who was uh, potentially going to be using the product, and this was a little bit. It's almost uh, out, outside of the realm of the topic, but it's it kind of similar. And they were using DHEA. They wanted to use DHEA, and uh, on the bottle of the DHEA, it gave a warning about increasing, possibly increasing estrogen. And um, again, I think. This is very similar to what you're saying about the, the stress-induced excitatory or excitot- excitotoxic effects um, of that. It, the estrogen itself possibly would be uh, produced in a person taking DHA if they were under stress, no? Or, or, and if they weren't under stress, if they were using progesterone uh, and they had adequate thyroid and you know their diet was good with sugars, you know, fruit sugars, etc. in their diet, and they had enough metabolic energy, they wouldn't produce estrogen from DHA because of that? 
Um, right. Um, and DHEA and progesterone uh, both will break the uh, learned helplessness pattern of, of too much uh, nitric oxide. Yeah. But uh, what causes uh, DHEA and testosterone to be turned into estrogen excessively is uh, anything basically causing stress, uh, irritation, inflammation. Uh, the uh, enzyme that makes estrogen aromatase mm -hmm. is activated by uh, anything that, that stresses cells. And uh, it, the processes that are reversed by uh, thyroid and progesterone uh, are activated by, for example, uh, prostaglandins, uh, which are uh, derived from polyunsaturated fatty acids, which happen to uh, synergize with estrogen in many ways. Yeah. Uh, the prostaglandins activate uh, the formation of, of estrogen, and uh, progesterone, thyroid, and aspirin, too, will uh, uh, turn off aromatase right. uh, by, among other things, inhibiting the, the uh, activity of uh, the enzyme that makes uh, polyunsaturated fats turn into prostaglandins. Hmm, cool. I, I'm going to hold you there very briefly, Dr. Pete. We do have a couple of callers on the line already, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and take this first caller. You're on the air? Hey, my name is Jackie. I live right here. I live in Well Gulch. Okay. Hey, um, Jackie. I, I have that uh, premenstrual seizure problem, but it's actually not just premenstrual. In, in my experience, it's been about, more recently, it's been like a week before and after my period. There's definitely hormonal cycles dictating that. That's clear. Uh, but how, long, how long have you had this for? Oh, about three years now. And how so old are you? I'm 28. Okay. So I have like a grand mal seizure once a month. Mm -hmm. wow. I have a real memory problem because wow. of that. Yeah. But okay. I'm calling because I'm I'm wondering, you talk about having more thyroid hormone, but how do you promote the production of more thyroid hormone and does like vitamin B6 have anything to do with that? I have more questions <laughs> beyond this too. <laughs> well, Dr. Pete, just um, if perhaps you'd a answer uh, your, your way of approaching her um, seizures uh, as you've mentioned it at the very beginning of the show it's pertinent that she's called i'm, I'm happy you did call in because i have lots of good advice for you um and also uh, your your approach to its treatment well uh, in an emergency situation uh, you can uh, have a, a good probability of of either stopping or reducing the severity of of uh, seizures uh, just with progesterone but in the long run you want to uh, stop the uh, intake of, of the polyunsaturated fats that activate estrogen and uh, uh, inhibit thyroid. Uh, the, the degree of unsaturation of the fat uh, corresponds to the degree of interference with thyroid hormone. Uh, so fish oil is more uh, anti-thyroid than uh, 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 the seed oils and uh, the singly unsaturated fat in olive oil, for example, is uh, very uh, weakly anti-thyroid. Uh, butter, uh, coconut oil, uh, cream, beef, and, and lamb fat, for example, are not anti-thyroid. Uh, <laughs> the um, uh, traditional diets before 1940, uh, even in the industrial countries, uh, people commonly got quite a bit of thyroid in their food. Um, if you w would stew a chicken or a fish, for example, the thyroid would always uh, break up and, and be consumed as part of the food. And uh, with that traditional diet, a person probably averaged about the equivalent of maybe 30 milligrams a day of armor thyroid uh, in the natural uh, fresh uh, glandular uh, material. Uh, so uh, the uh, w one thing that has contributed to uh, hypothyroidism resulting in high estrogen and uh, overactivity of the 
parasympathetic excitatory system. Uh, one factor is is just the uh, removal of natural thyroid from the food supply, but at the same time, the diet has been industrialized to include lots of these uh, seed oils, which are both pro-estrogen and anti-thyroid. And in themselves, uh, they are excitatory, uh, produce edema of the brain and so on. Um, well, I've definitely had a history of the, the edema, right, like the swelling up. I thought I was fat, and they gave me an IV diuretic in the hospital one day. I peed out eight pounds of water, but so I've been using dandelion root to deal with the water retention. But beyond that, since I've cut out estrogenic foods from my diet as much as possible, like including soy stuff and all, like, process, unprocessed or improperly processed soy, my gut has gotten a lot flatter, and I really haven't been working out. But my source for progesterone, like, is chase tree berries. And I am under the impression that over time it can work even just like the time-released IUD so that after, like, a year I may not even have my menstrual cycle anymore, but that it, like, accumulates over time that it will help rebalance my uh, hormonal imbalance so I'll have more progesterone and less estrogen. I wonder if you know anything about chase tree berry, if you've heard of this. <laughs> it's also known as Vitex berry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Vitex has traditionally been a pro progesterogenic um, uh, for sure, and definitely used for menstruating women to reduce the severity of symptoms of high estrogen, which would typically be uh, edema, uh, PMS, uh, etc., mood swings, um, and long, heavy bleeding. Um, just, just very briefly, did you say dandelion root? Did you mean dandelion leaf? Both of them. Okay. The root is the strong diuretic, and the leaf is a mild diuretic. Yeah, the, both liver tonic. Yeah, the root's actually a cholagog. It's more of a bile stimulant, and the leaf is specifically a diuretic, and it contains potassium. So it's better than the furosemide and the other so-called potassium-sparing diuretics. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm more, more interested in... Uh, Helping you out here with Dr. Pete's advice for your epilepsy, I think that's probably the most uh, the most pertinent part of what you said. Uh, the minerals are very important too for uh, uh, getting the balance of of the nervous system, uh, making sure you have enough of all of the alkaline minerals: uh, potassium, sodium, calcium, and magnesium. And uh, fruit and milk are very important for those. Yeah, you recommend, uh, I know you recommend uh, magnesium, a good source of that is coffee, and uh, calcium obviously is the milk and dairy products, and then sodium was just from regular salt, and you do advocate uh, people use salt, and then that's been a whole topic of other previous shows, so probably best not to go in that in, in that direction. Yeah. Well, I can add to this too, like I, I tried to have a vegan diet for a while, and I basically starved myself and uh-huh. depleted all my minerals, so yeah. along with the, the high high fluid i had i was regularly being diagnosed with low sodium Mm -hmm. and i've just like become more aware of these like the need for these other um the other minerals but i find that calcium and magnesium you can get that from nettle actually yeah or from any green any large leafy green that you would uh you're emphasizing the alkaline and you say drink coffee to get these things coffee is really well from from magnesium well dr p what do you say about coffee and acidity oh well uh decaf is is fine as a source of of uh, niacin and uh, magnesium, uh, but another good source uh, of all the minerals, but especially magnesium, is um, well cooked green leaves. Uh, the um, undercooked uh, greens aren't digestible and and can actually increase your uh, inflammatory nitric oxide and such and. Uh, Irritation of the intestine from uh, starchy, uh, undercooked uh, vegetable matter will, uh, by increasing the nitric oxide, that causes water retention, causes the intestine to to suck up water and put it into the bloodstream, but it causes the kidneys to lose sodium. So uh, the uh, problem that happens uh, with a lot of stress and degenerative uh, conditions uh, is is uh, centered around the uh, water retention but imbalance uh, produced by losing sodium too fast. 
And so first aid is just to get your minerals up. And, uh, for example, uh, resuscitation uh, can be done uh, more efficiently with extremely uh, hyper-osmotic uh, concentrated mineral solution, sodium chloride, for example, uh, six or seven times more concentrated than the physiological solution. Just injecting a small amount of that can bring a person out of shock because it uh, inhibits the formation of nitric oxide, uh, uh, helps the kidneys retain sodium, and uh, starts the system producing energy. Uh, but uh, just making sure that your daily diet includes plenty of sodium and, and the other alkaline metals is uh, very helpful. Okay, we do actually have three other callers, uh, so I don't want to... Well, can I just add one more sure, thing? Because sure. you're talking about Alzheimer's. I learned that, that turmeric, this herb, can be very helpful for Alzheimer's because Alzheimer's can be a result of iron deposits in the brain, and just as much as turmeric can remove free radical iron from the joints and blood system, it removes it from the brain. So just a, a real answer to Alzheimer's, too. But we can leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, no problem. You're welcome. Okay, so let's get these next callers. You're on the air? Yes, uh, this is David in Missouri. Hey, David. Um, this is a question, a very general question about learned helplessness, and I think we can define this as learned helplessness. You know, I'm, I'm just looking at what's going on in the world right now, and especially in this country and in Europe. You have... Um, all these different things occurring, such as NSA and possibly going to war in Syria when, you know, 92% of the people are against it, and just on and on and on, all these different things that the government are actually engaged in. And, you know, you have all these different people that either want to put their head in the sand or there are people that want to fight, and there are all these people in between. And I'm just curious, Dr. Pete, what you think about um, you know, I'm, I'm also saying this in the context of the rats that are, you know, put into a situation where they can't fight back or they can fight back and the difference between there being hope and then they're just, just giving up. Um, do you think about that very much in terms of humanity? Oh, that was exactly why I decided to write this newsletter right now. I've been following the research actually since 1960. And uh, it was especially uh, the uh, the social uh, behavior of the government and uh, how they have manipulated uh, the, the press and uh, uh, the public uh, helplessness. Actually, it's it's been designed since the late 1940s. It's been actual government policy to uh, manipulate. Uh, the, the mass media and, and event to um, create helplessness in the population. You know, um, and I guess I'm just I'm I'm hoping that everybody listening and that we don't see this as being negative, but we see this as you know we all have to be engaged in 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 standing up against everything that's going on because it's just awesome. The, the force that's being exerted against the people, you know, in Europe and here and, you know, everywhere. That's mass and media for you. Uh, people, are, people are surely as uh, smart as rats, and rats <laughs> just needed a little hint <laughs> of a possibility of escape. And yeah, and, then, you know, it, it's almost like what we're really lacking is intelligence and creativity, which I know you talk about a lot. It's like... Uh, it, it's obvious that these things have been suppressed. I mean, it's like you say, it, it's an active program to condition and brainwash and just cause us not even to really even think about resisting. You know, it's like, wow, wake up. <laughs> you know, it's like this is this is a very small amount of people that are that are in control, and we've got you know seven billion people on the planet. You know, it's like, wow, okay, well, that's I guess that's how it is, huh? In, in so anyway, that was one of my things. I, I just I, I keep thinking about you know all the dynamics of of the the health of the organism and 
and the psychological aspects and, you know, all these things that are going on right now, it's got to have a profound effect on the health of, of human beings. You know, it's just amazing. In one of the studies um, in which rats had been uh, taught learned helplessness so they would drown in five or six minutes, uh, just being able to see another rat escape would let the informed rat uh, go for days without drowning. Uh, just the the recognition that someone else did it can make all the difference. Yep. Amen. Wow, that's something. Well, I hope we all uh, resist, whoever's listening. <laughs> so, anyway, um, I have one just r other really quick question, and I know there are no definite answers to these things. I know there's a lot of variables, uh, but I, I raise my own chickens, and I really feed them healthy. You know, they're, they're pretty much free-range. They eat all organic, non-GMO. In fact, I grow a lot of the feed that I feed them. And I'm curious, is, if, if, if you know where that egg's coming from, is, is there a benefit to eating these raw? It does not bother me putting an egg in a glass and drinking it, but sometimes I think maybe there's a bacteria in there, especially what I've learned from you that maybe we don't want that in the stomach, you know? I'm just uh, curious. And is the egg actually better for you raw rather than lightly cooking it or a hard-boiled egg being just as good or maybe all of them having different variants of nutrition depending on, you know, how it's uh, prepared? In moderate amounts, even raw eggs are fine, very digestible, and they're antiseptic in the raw state. So uh, they've seen... Uh, the uh, raw egg yolk kill viruses that uh, uh, other uh, related chemicals weren't able to, to destroy. Uh, well, you know, they say you shouldn't wash the eggs because they will spoil quicker and because there's actually a natural envelope around the egg of bacteria. Have you heard that? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, but, so, but, you know, so is there a benefit to eating raw eggs over cooking them because you're going to get uh, certain types of vitamins and minerals and the fats maybe that well, I'm thinking are probably polyunsaturated fats to a certain degree? Are those fats maybe better because they're not cooked? If they would be, uh, if the chickens were fed a more saturated diet like they used to with uh, uh, orchard waste uh, apples that were spoiling and uh, whey from the cheese industry that then uh, the, the, um, uh, the the animals eating uh, those foods um, in, in Mexico old tortillas are fed to the chickens regularly with chopped fruit and vegetables and yeah these the guys eat everything I mean they eat fruit in fact they've been eating watermelon now for days and they <laughs> eat cantaloupe and you know in season so so the sugar in that instance is what's giving them the yeah, that makes the saturated fat probably. Yeah, that makes the egg fat uh, much safer, and uh, uh, in the raw state, it's it has that germicidal effect. And I've known uh, several people who uh, cured their leukemia by drinking eggnogs, uh, fruit juice, really? and milk, and raw wow. eggs. And then just one other question regarding a raw product. Um, and again, I think I understand where you're coming from, you know, from different things that you said regarding milk and there really not being a problem with it being pasteurized because it's still such a high quality food. But if you're sourcing raw milk that the cows are pretty much just eating grass and you're obviously not having an allergic reaction, is it better as far as the nutrients to drink it raw if you can find that? Yes, yeah, slightly better. Okay. But it's not that big of a deal. Um, no, it, it, uh, if you have really good milk, uh, it's okay to pasteurize it, but it, it's slightly better in the raw state. Okay. All right. I'd better hold you there. Thank you for your call. We Thank do, you. We, yeah, you're very welcome. We do have another caller on the line. want to make sure we get to them and anyone else uh, who'd like to call in. So next caller, you're on the air? Uh, hey, this is uh, Pat up in Bayside. Hi, Pat. What's your question? Uh, I just had a question about uh, 5-HTP, uh, mainly if you think it's safe to take as a supplement. Dr. Pete, did you hear um, that? And no, it does tend to increase serotonin, and uh, serotonin 
like histamine, uh, can increase uh, nitric oxide and and set those uh, inflammatory processes in in motion. So 5-HTP is not a good thing to take. <laughs> It is not. It's not. No. Did you did you hear Dr. Pete's explanation or? Uh, 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 yeah, if, if five, uh, the um, uh, any form of of tryptophan uh, tends to increase uh, the serotonin, and the serotonin uh, tends to increase uh, those inflammatory things, estrogen and uh, nitric oxide. Okay, so that's not good. No. <laughs> No, All you right. Sh- you shouldn't. You. you shouldn't take it. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, so we've got ten minutes left. Uh, if people would like to call in, it's one eight hundred K M U D RAD. Uh, we're joined by Dr. Raymond Pete. Uh, we're talking about some generalized questions now about thyroid and uh, things. Mis- people's misconceptions about it. I think I get asked fairly frequently these days. Uh, uh, does thyroid do this? Does it do that? What about this? What about that? I thought best just to answer some questions very quickly. Um, People think about uh, thyroid hormone as being a stimulant, Dr. Pete, and that uh, they'll get pr- problems with high blood pressure if they take thyroid. I know it's not true, but would you just explain that? Um, it, yeah, I was just um, previously mentioning that hypothyroid people have increased nitric oxide, but at the same time they have a, a tendency of too much contraction of the blood vessels and high blood pressure. So uh, the... the um, uh, at, at least nitric oxide isn't able to uh, maintain a good blood flow if your thyroid is low. Uh, the thyroid does, uh, I think, the basic thing that relaxes the blood vessels produced by uh, thyroid hormone is carbon dioxide. Uh, hypothyroid people uh, tend to have uh, chronically increased lactic acid in their blood, which displaces uh, carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide relaxes blood vessels in a very different way uh, than the uh, uh, interfering with energy supply that nitric oxide does carbon dioxide uh, uh, retains a high energy level uh, while relaxing uh, partly just by uh, changing the uh, electrical uh, pH behavior of the cell. It uh, acidifies the cell, which relaxes it. Uh, and uh, uh, that relaxing effect of, of increasing uh, carbon dioxide from higher uh, thyroid function uh, makes your capillaries and arterioles relax and uh, let the blood flow through uh, providing oxygen to the tissues, which then uh, produce more carbon dioxide and uh, keep the system uh, active and circulating. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, carbon dioxide and thyroid both uh, tend to increase the stroke volume of the heart the same way progesterone does, uh, where the um, parasympathetic nervous system and estrogen decrease the stroke volume and uh, uh, weaken weaken the heart. Uh, okay. Thyroid has, has a, an energizing but relaxing function. Right. Because, go ahead. Sorry. Um, it, it increases the ability of uh, cells to retain magnesium by because magnesium is bound to the ATP energy carrying molecule and uh, by increasing the oxidation of the cell to produce ATP, the cell then binds magnesium and releases calcium, which is the excitatory thing. Uh, So uh, if you have magnesium in your system and are producing carbon dioxide, uh, your cells will retain the relaxing uh, magnesium. And uh, you can see that in the... uh, uh, the way your muscles work, your heart, uh, it shows up in the electrocardiogram as a, a quick repolarization, uh, getting ready and relaxed, ready for a new stimulation. And um, in your brain, it shows up as quick transition from wakefulness 
into sleep at night uh, without having to uh, go through a lot of preparation. Uh, the, the brain uh, is able to quickly uh, relax by uh, increasing its ATP and, and oxygen and carbon dioxide. Excellent. Okay, well, listen, we do have a few more callers, Dr. Pete, so perhaps we should see if we can quickly get each one through so the next person has a chance to uh, okay. ask their question. So let's take the first caller. Quick and easy through me. Oh, uh, through you. Are you aware of Hawthorne University in Whitethorn, and are you a part of that? Uh, you know what? No, I'm not. <laughs> That's a quick question. <laughs> How about the next caller? You're on Hello? the air? Yeah, you're on the air. Hi. Um, I have a lot of questions, so I'll ask a short one. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. I understand that there's a, a Dr. Horowitz, among other people, who claim that listening to sounds at 528 hertz will heal DNA. What is your understanding of this? Um, a, a good person to, to read on that issue would be uh, Harold Hillman, who did experiments with it uh, in uh, England and got fired <laughs> or got retired <laughs> prematurely. Uh, but it, it's definitely something uh, Russian research in the uh, early 70s uh, showed that certain musical tones would cause muscle uh, to increase its ATP production. Uh, and uh, that was disregarded because uh, the uh, uh, level of, of the energy in a given vibration was considered to be too small to exceed uh, the thermal uh, agitation of the molecules of the muscle, but actually the muscle is organized uh, with long-range structures in the water, which form, in effect, an antenna that can receive sound waves of these of very low energies. Cool. So it's <laughs> physically very plausible and verified by Harold Hillman. Excellent. Well, as always, thanks so much so for that. Um, obviously, you're not saying like an emphatic yes, but you're saying it's totally within the realm of possibility? Yes. I Excellent. We, so better, we better take the next call. I think we've got three or four. You'll be well. Bye-bye well, now. Yeah, thanks so much for your call. Next caller? Uh do you believe in time management or energy management versus time management? And it's always easier to ask your own questions. <laughs> I've got one last one, maybe. Um, I, I don't know. I think that was a rhetorical question. We've got a we've got an engineer with a rhetorical question. What? No, no, it was an oh. actual question from people. But people, oh. it's I cannot they... give a complex question. I can give a three-word question for you. And I think we're actually out of time for callers today. So. It's 7.54, though, okay. engineer. We've got plenty you, of time. If you can get a 30-second question in with a one-minute response, please call 923-3911. So are you saying there's no more callers on the air or not? Correct. They dropped. Okay, fine. Okay, well, we've got five minutes left here, Dr. Pete. So how about a very quick uh, breakdown of cholesterol's control by thyroid? Okay. Um, uh, in three minutes. <laughs> in the 1930s, uh, it was demonstrated uh, and graphs were published showing that when a person's thyroid gland was removed, the, um, as their metabolic rate declined, the blood cholesterol increased. And when they were given a supplement of thyroid, it was just like a mirror image. As the metabolic rate increased, the cholesterol declined. And uh, that, that at the time, that was just a gross empirical observation, but it allowed uh, many doctors to diagnose hypothyroidism simply by looking at uh, elevated cholesterol in the blood. It was one of the yeah. well-recognized uh -huh. signs of hypothyroidism, right. but when the, uh, the uh, essential fatty acid uh, lowering of the um, cholesterol and drugs to lower cholesterol came on the scene, uh, it was discouraged, um, the uh, connection between thyroid and cholesterol, because it was too simple to um, cure high <laughs> cholesterol, uh, to correct it just by correcting the thyroid function. But how it works is that it activates the conversion of cholesterol to uh, primarily pregnenolone and progesterone. And that was demonstrated by pumping 
blood into an ovary and measuring the amount of cholesterol going in and the amount of progesterone coming out, if they decreased the cholesterol in the blood, the ovary produced less progesterone. Hmm. Excellent. Okay. Well, it is 7.57. We've still got three minutes left, but I won't go on too much because we don't want to go over time. Um, so thank you very much, Dr. Pete. I'll just let people know how they can get hold of your material and find out more about you. Okay. Thanks so much for your time again. Thank you. Re really appreciate it. Okay. Well, I know we had a bunch of people there who wanted to ask questions and unfortunately didn't have enough time. And maybe we should open up the uh, airways at 20 past seven next time. Who knows? I never know whether we get lots of people or just a few people. So, uh, www.raypeat.com, raypeat.com, uh, plenty of information there, articles and all the rest, and lots and lots of scientifically proven documents. And uh, we can also be reached, 1888-WBM-HERB, uh, Monday through Friday, for any questions. Thanks so much for calling, and I uh, really appreciate your uh, involvement. And until next month, good night.